Well, we've come to the point at this point, everybody, that I've really been looking forward to on the show today because we get a chance to talk to somebody who not only has has been involved in wrestling himself for a couple of generations, but actually goes about four generations farther back than that in his family lineage. The Welch family, as we have talked about, and their descendants uh, pretty much invented pro wrestling in the South uh, for the most part, or or at least perfected it. And uh, joining us today, he's been a wrestler, a booker, a promoter. Uh, he's been in professional hockey. Uh, he's going to be starting a stud cast very soon, which is even studlier than a podcast ladies and gentlemen the tennessee stud ron fuller ron thank you for being here thank you very much jim it's my pleasure uh you and i go back quite a few years too and uh you know i haven't even spoken to you in many many years i hadn't had the opportunity but uh well, wait, i hear wait, you're doing great come on, go, let's go ahead and let's get it over with because brian last d- demanded that we tell this on the air i i have we haven't spoken a while because i thought you were still mad at me because i got you sued when i tried to kill that outlaw wrestling promoter in in knoxville that time <laughs> and i thought there might be yeah. heat. no 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 man i was i was i was afraid that there might be lingering heat on my end because because you tried to kill him and then you end up getting in trouble for it so no, it's a, it was a strange situation there. But I still have the, the challenge that you sent out to him in the flyer that you, you challenged him to a shoot fight for charity in Chilhowee Park, and it was worded brilliantly. We won't litigate that matter here in this forum again, but I still have that posted on my bulletin board above my desk here in, in the castle. Uh, well, uh, you, you know, the challenge still stands. <laughs> and you and you, would yeah, still, I mean, you would still win it. Oh hell yes! Oh hell yes! I'm still ready to do it. <laughs> well, I, I mentioned the stud cast, and we're going to tell people more about where they'll be able to find it. It's it's debuting soon, but the 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 theme of your podcast is going to be exactly what I wanted to talk to you about here today because there's a lot of stories that get told of the the continental wrestling days and. And uh, maybe the the eighties when people started getting you know the the cable and seeing other wrestling programs, but your stories and your family stories literally go back to the twenties. And and your grandfather Roy Welch was Nick Gullis's partner in the uh, Nashville booking office for forty years or or thereabouts. And and at one point, a member of your family descended from that uh had a ownership or a booking office role in pretty much every territory south of indiana i think except carolinas at one point in time what what do you remember about your grandfather roy welch did you get a chance to see him wrestle what uh, tell us some stories about roy welch oh roy was an absolute character man I, i don't think there's anybody quite like him uh i was I went to my first wrestling match when I was nine days old, and there, and Roy and Herb and Lester, the three three of the four brothers, wrestled in a six man tag. I don't remember much of that because I was nine days old, obviously, but uh, that's how far back I go. And I travel with my granddad a lot when I was a kid, say between the ages of uh, eight and fourteen. Uh, he ran, as you can imagine, uh, his office was in Nashville, but they ran at one time in 12 states. And he developed the, and built the entire territory after he left Ohio. He was born in Oklahoma. He, he was, his dad was a half Indian. His mother was Irish. Uh, those boys, his, him and his brothers were brought up really tough. Three of them were born in about a Six year time frame, uh, uh, Roy, Lester, and her, and I mean, uh, Roy Herb and Jack Welch, all three of those were born. And then 20 years later, Lester was born. So, uh, Roy started out, uh, and, and I'll give you one story real quick just to give you an idea of what kind of life these boys lived. Uh, when he was nine years old, uh, he had Herb was seven and his older brother was 12. The, their dads, they lived in New Mexico, the plains of New Mexico, and they had few cows. And then in order for the cows to live in the wintertime up there on the plains of New Mexico, it got cold and snowed. They drove them south 200 miles. The three boys walked with no shoes on to, to herd the cows, and, and their dad, Ed, the half-Indian, wore, he rode the horse. 
So <laughs> they went 200 miles south. They bypassed all the barbed wire fence they came to. They rode as far one direction or another until the end fence ended, and they went a little further and a little further. They got 200 miles or so south down into the southern plains of New Mexico where it stayed warmer. And uh, at the end of the, the end of the trip, took them, uh, took them, I don't know how many days. He said probably a week. And they spent every night on, you know, sleeping. They, and then they drove the cows every day. So once they got there where he was going to leave them, his daddy pulled out a piece of barbed wire and he made a wrap. He wrapped it around in a circle, put a little handle-like deal on the top of it, and he took him to a rabbit hole. And he says. Here's what you do to, to to get a rabbit. He wired that. He run that thing down in a hole and squirmed it around. It hooked in the rabbit's hair. He pulled the rabbit out. He taught him how to build a fire. And the next day, he woke him up, and he got the other two. He got Herb and Jack uh, ready to go. And he said, Roy, he says, now he's nine years old. He says, Roy, uh, you're going to stay here with these cows. You're going to sleep with them and follow them every day. Wherever they go, you stay with them. You wire the rabbits out of the ground. You build yourself a fire. I'm leaving you a couple of blankets to sleep on, and I'll be back in three months. Oh, Jesus Christ. So he left him in the southern part of New Mexico. They didn't come back three months later, and they had to find him. Because, you know, he's the cows have moved. Yeah. And he's following the cows. Well, they took, I don't know how long to find him, but he says, then they take him back, back home. You know, so at nine years old, he spends three months in southern New Mexico plains by himself, wiring rabbits out of the ground and feeding himself, and drinking water where he could find it. And that's kind of the way they were raised. One more story. Herb, well, let, let, you let, know let, Herb. Let me, let me ask you this. Okay. Which, do you, which do you think was a harder experience, that or being partners with Nick Goulis? <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. We'll get back to that. You know, you probably no, no, don't no. know the history of how Nick Goulis came about. No, I don't on. know if you know that. Tell, tell the previous story about the family. I'm just, I'm laughing because that, and we're talking about the 19 teens, right? When, when. Oh yeah. We're, we're talking about, he was born in, in night. He was born in 1902. He's nine years old. We're talking about 1911. So they, they, you know, it's not like they could just hop in the car and run to the store when they needed something to eat in those days on the plains. It was. Oh, hell no. Good they, they had they only had a horse. All they had was one horse, and uh, you know they had a few cows. And uh, actually, Roy said he thinks his dad rustled the cows. He didn't own the cows. He went and stole the cows. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and they, they, you know they drive them south in the winter, and they bring them back north in uh, in the summer, in the summertime. And uh, and so the, another story, real quick. Herb was Roy's younger brother. Herb was really a tough guy, uh, like Roy. All of them were tough because of the way they were raised. But Roy told me one time they're walking down a path. He said they're about the same age. They got no shoes on. He says there's a tarantula in the middle of the path. He said he stuck up about five inches high. He's all spread out, and his legs are all up. And Roy jumps out of the path, and Jack comes to him. He jumps out of the path. Now Herb is seven years old, and he just walks over. Don't even don't even hesitate. Raises his leg and stomps that tarantula right in the ground with his heel. <laughs> grinds him in the ground, and just keeps on walking. And when he when he stops him, they all go, oh, gosh, man, that's a tarantula. It can kill you. And he said, ah, it's just a spider. And uh, <laughs> just kept walking. So this is kind of the mind, the, the mindset and what type of background they came from. This is real quick, obviously, of what it was. But uh, uh, they had a real tough life. Roy had a fifth-grade education. Uh, I don't know how he got that education. I don't know how he went to school for fifth year, five years uh, or where he went to school. But uh, he ended up building the biggest territory probably ever in the history of the South. And uh, at the same time, he built one of the biggest dairies in the South that milked a 1,000 cows a day. He built both of them over a 20-year period of time. Uh, he was a pretty phenomenal guy, but he was a... Uh, he was a mean son of a gun. Well, and and also he was a star wrestler uh, before all of that was, which is the way he was able to build the territory because he he got over the ring. Uh, Herb and Roy Welch. I did some research for uh, my book on Louisville wrestling here. Herb and Roy Welch in 1943 had the first tag team match in the city of Louisville. And, yes. and, and 
he had wrestled all over the South and, and it was, I think Herb was a bigger star of longer because Roy got into promotion, but Roy was a, a, a bigger star earlier. Was he not? Yes. Roy actually started the wrestling and, uh, he started wrestling before any of them. And, uh, he was, him and Herb were world tag team champions at one time. That's probably back in the, the, the early 40s, late 30s. They were tag team champions of, of the world. And, uh, and before Roy set up his territory, he was, he was wrestling a lot of places. So, and he was trained by, I don't know if you know this story, uh, the guy named Cal Farley. You ever hear Cal Farley? Oh, my God. And the Boys Ranch in, in, in Amherst. There Hall, you trained, go. Uh, Dory Funk Sr. and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> There you go. Cal Farley was born in 1895. Roy was born in 1902. Cal Farley, Roy went, Roy went to Amarillo, uh, and he was working in the oil fields in Borger, Texas. He went to Amarillo. He wanted to watch a wrestling deal, and Cal Farley was wrestling. And he met Cal Farley. Cal liked him and said, you know, I'm going to try to train you. So Cal Farley trained Roy for a little bit. Cal Farley, you know, Cal Farley had a stamp, a U.S. Post Office stamp named after him in 1996. I did not know that. that. He was a huge, huge name. He was called the foster father of America. He had so many boys' ranches and so many, he took in so many kids. He was a real humanitarian. And, uh, so he, he gets involved with Roy. He takes him through a couple of trainings, a couple of, uh, you know, he worked out with him for a couple of weeks. And he said, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine who's an even better shooter. Now, obviously, Cal was a shooter. Cal wrestled in World War I in the Army and uh, came back. He was born in Iowa, went to the World War I in the Army, wrestled, and came back and turned pro and, and moved to Amarillo from Iowa. So he introduces Roy to the Dutch Mantel, the real old time Dutch Mantel. The for the first you know thing and, and Dutch Dutch is, is uh Dutch's name is an homage to an old timer. Not a lot of people remember that anymore. That's it. And so I don't know how much you know about Dutch Mantel, but Dutch Mantel was a tremendous shooter. He was really, really tough. And he so Roy went to work out with him and Dutch Dutch, the first time he worked out with him, uh, broke his ribs on purpose, kind of a la uh, Hulk Hogan in his first trip to the Sportatorium in Tampa. Dutch wanted to, Dutch didn't want to train him, you know, and back in those days, those guys could all shoot and, you know, they didn't want to spend the time to teach somebody all that stuff that they need to know, need to know. So he wanted to discourage him and he broke his ribs on purpose. He put him in a hook scissor and broke his ribs and Roy left there been over sideways, could hardly breathe, took him four months to get over the cracked ribs. And he went back after four months to again. And, uh, and Dutch broke his wrist, sent him out of there again. He's yeah, broke his wrist the second time. And he got, he got healed from the wrist. He went back again and Dutch talked like that, like a Dutchman. And he says, you know, uh, boy, you, you really stupid. You want to, you, you want more? You know, and Roy says, yeah, I want to learn, you know. So Dutch really all of a sudden took him seriously and said, okay, I'll train you. And uh, that's kind of where he got his training from. And during this time, I got stories. See, from riding with Roy, he told me all kinds of stories. I said, what kind of guy was this Dutch man tell? He said he was very wealthy. I said, how did he get to be a wealthy wrestler in the early 1900s? And he said, he said he, what he did is he said he had a little scam he worked. He would go from town to town, and he would go into the saloons. That's back in the days when there was dirt roads, if you had a road at all. There was no communication. There was no phones, no, no way that anybody could talk to each other from 10 or 15 miles away. They very rarely saw each other. So he would go into a town. He'd go in the saloon about afternoon when people were saloons were filling up and he'd be a real loud mouth it was a small guy wasn't big but he knew how to how to shoot so he'd go in and he'd start making a lot of noise and say hey i'm here to i'm here i'm a betting man and i'm a great runner i can i can run like the wind man and i'll guarantee i'll bet anybody here i can beat the fastest runner in town <laughs> and uh you know 
they wouldn't know what the hell to, to, to think. So, you know, he wouldn't get a whole lot of bets on the first first go round. They they would go out and they'd find a couple of friends and say, Hey, there's a guy over here and he's talking about covering all the bets. So he would cover the bets, what little bets there was in the first round, because they were taking they were conservative. They didn't know what the hell this guy's all about. He'd go race somebody and I mean they'd beat the hell out of him, right? So he'd go <laughs> back into the bar and he'd be now he's mad and he would go, Damn, you know, ah, well I maybe I ain't that fast, but I'm strong. I can arm wrestle anybody. I'll beat anybody here at arm wrestling. Well, now they all go, wow, well, this guy's stupid, right? Oh, you know, he ain't classic. strong. Okay, so he, it was this guy's an idiot. You know, he don't even look strong. So they now everybody's half the, half the guys in the bar, they run out of the saloon and they go find their buddies and they go, Jesus, come on down here. This guy's covering <laughs> covering all these bets and he ain't, he ain't shit, right? So they bring him back down there and uh, they all show up. They bring in a big guy. They find themselves a big, strong guy. They sit down at the table and they crowd around to watch the deal and Bam! I mean, he, he just lets the guy slam his arm down on the table. Now they're going, wow, this guy's a dummy. He pays off the bets, and then he goes, all right, now, that's it. Yeah, and now I'm going to double the bets, and I'll wrestle somebody. Now they really, they look at each other, and they go, well, he ain't fast. He ain't strong. How the hell can he be a good wrestler? <laughs> they go, they all leave the saloon. This, is, this Roy tells me he's the, this is the way he did it. He said they all then ran out and they said, "Come on!" They found their friends, their buddies. They said, "Just bring your pocketbook, man. This guy's gonna cover all the bets and double them, and uh, we'll just we'll all gonna we're all gonna get rich." So they all come back. He gathers up all the bets. He covers the bets. They walk outside in the dirt road in front of the saloon, and he wipes the guy out in about two minutes. Breaks his arm, whatever he does, and and and. Leaves the town with all the money in town, practically, and he just goes 15, 20 miles down the road. He does the same thing again. Oh my God! Oh, that's fucking great. It, 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 and ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of entertainment you're going to have in store for you when the stud cast debuts in the podcasting world, because that is the epitome. That is the essence. That is the the that's pro wrestling right there at its heart. Oh, that is the most it, artful description of professional wrestling I have ever seen in my life. It just, it really explains the life and the times of that time. Uh, and, and the guys that were in the business back in those days, they were all shooters there. You didn't get to be a wrestler without being able to shoot in those days. And, uh, you know, now guys go just buy themselves a rare pair of wrestling shoes and some tights somewhere, and, they, and you know, they crawl into a ring somewhere. They don't know their butts from a hole in the ground, right? Well, it's just ridiculous. Let, let me let me ask you this then about Roy, because, and, and you mentioned, uh, starting like that and ending up uh, owning, uh, you know, part of the biggest territory in the South, it, it, after he, it, I've always thought that maybe the, as I've studied it, the relationship between he and Nick Goulas was when they first met Roy had gotten over as a star. He kind of had a crew of guys that he could probably depend on one, a book and he needs the business guy. And, and, and also, cause he was still an active wrestler, not to just come out and say, I'm the boss, which is that where Nick came in? How, how did that relationship form? That. That's exactly how it was. I mean, Roy was, he built his territory and started spreading out so fast that he took family members to begin with. He took guys that were part of the family and he situated them in different parts of the South so that he could control and develop that ter that area, that area. And, uh, he ran out of, he ran out of, he needed that businessman. And that's what Nick was. Do you know where Nick came from? Nick lived in Birmingham and Roy was running Birmingham and Nick was just coming and hanging out as a guy, as a fan, a big <laughs> Mark. And, and he asked Roy, he said, you know, he said, can I do something? And Roy said, you, uh, you want to put out cards? He had him putting out wrestling cards. And then Nick put out wrestling cards. I guess he did a good job. He built a little relationship with Roy. And Roy said, realized that he's a pretty smart businessman. And he said, well, I need a guy. So he says, you want to be my partner? I'll take you to Nashville. And that's how Nick Goulas got involved with Roy. And for the next, that was uh, late thirties, right? So for the next 40 years, uh, out of the Nashville booking office, 
those guys controlled probably one of the largest rosters of not, not saying every town got every wrestler, but this would say ran or supplied talent to three or four towns a night all over Alabama and Tennessee and parts, Kentucky and Arkansas, Mississippi, whatever. Um, they had more guys really in being booked by the office running hundreds and hundreds of shows a year. And those, those big towns, Chattanooga, Nashville, Birmingham had stretches of years at a time where they did four or 5,000 people a week, just the, the incredible oh, yeah. numbers. It was, it was insane. The amount of towns that that office ran and the amount of talent that they had at one time where they'd have eight top heel teams with six different managers rotating around these various territories that they, they, they booked. It was insane. Yeah, it was it was a mega territory. It, it actually ran in twelve states. It ran everything south of Indiana and Ohio, all the way to the Gulf Coast. It ran in as far west as Louisiana, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Missouri, and as far east as into no, edges of North Carolina, and and uh, just anything west of Georgia or Florida. Actually, in the panhandle of Florida, they ran Pensacola, they ran Panama City, they ran down to Tallahassee. I mean, uh, they had areas, and, and you're right, the crowds were four or 5,000 in those three cities, but my dad got sent to Mobile, Alabama when I was a kid in 1954, Got on television down there. there. Was no TV. Got on television there. He got on television in Pensacola. He got on television in New Orleans. He was the first one to run in Louisiana. He was in New Orleans. He ran Mississippi towns, Biloxi, and those and those Gulfport, the towns along the coast, and uh, most of Mississippi. And he drew. This is pretty amazing. I don't think very few people know this. He drew forty thousand people in Mobile, Alabama in 1959 with him and Mario Galento and Joe Lewis as the referee. Well, and, and your father, by the way, Buddy Fuller, by the way, for those trying to keep track yeah. at home uh, of, of the, and I've always thought that the family tree should be sketched because just what you, just what you mentioned there between um, the fields and and and, yeah. and well, your your father first going down and being a big a big baby face, huge star, Southern champion in Georgia and Alabama and all those points, and and opening up the promotional area there and being an early Memphis Booker, when when they brought Memphis in the uh, Nashville office in '57, uh, I think Buddy was one of the first bookers down there. Uh, but it, everybody was establishing territories. That's where the modern Gulf Coast territory came from, and the Pensacola territory, and the. Uh, for a while, the, uh, the, the a couple of different territories in the state of Alabama. So everybody had their own roster, and everybody was running a full schedule of towns. It was just, it, almost any town of any size in the South had regular wrestling and had a member of your family in in the in the office. It was amazing. Yes, and then in some cases, uh, you know, he, he he expanded so far that he could not control all the towns. So as an example, Knoxville was owned by several different people. I purchased Knoxville from John Kazana, and uh, there was a guy in Chattanooga that was the owner of the town. So what he did is if he decided he didn't want to own it or it wasn't worth the fight to get ownership for it, he would he would provide the talent, like you were saying a minute ago. He had, at one time, 75, 80 wrestlers, and he had talent to send everywhere, and he got 10% booking fee off of towns that he didn't own. Those that he owned, he got 100%. Those that he didn't, he got 10%. And he provided talent uh, in 12 states. At one time, they were operating out of 12 states, probably the biggest territory when you figure 48 states that's 25 percent of america was being run by roy welch that's it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing and, and he didn't have to have national tv to do it and and be on 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 cable uh but i, I jest i kid um i don't want to skip over a, a buddy's accomplishments either but uh at, at the same time you mentioned knoxville and john kazana it was kind of the same thing that, that your father had done where they sent him down to open up new towns, uh, you know, in, in different places. How did you, you were still in your twenties when you bought Knoxville and turned it into Southeastern wrestling in 1974. I'm pretty sure you were probably the youngest NWA member at that point. Um, how, 
how did you get the idea that Knoxville would be the place? How did you put it together, et cetera, et cetera, to, to take that step? You'd only been wrestling at that point. What about five or six years? Four years. I started in 1970, 1970. I started in Georgia. Me and Rob worked uh, partners in Georgia for three months and I went to Tampa and I stayed there for four years, which was probably the best place in America to get the training that I needed to be a promoter because they had Gordon Soley. They had the greatest wrestling product. Their program was great. Their talent was great. Eddie Graham, Eddie Graham. You you know, Eddie Graham. Eddie, uh, there were a lot of bookers in there. Leo Garibaldi was there. Uh, Louis Tillette was there. There was a lot of bookers uh, toward the end. Bill Watts was there. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of not just talent that were there. There were a lot of great bookers that were there, guys that really had, had their, their stuff together, man. And they were cranking out business. And uh, so in 74, which is really fun, this odd story, I, I was going to take a vacation. And I said, I want, I've never been to Knoxville. I told my wife, I said, let's just go up there and spend a couple of days in Knoxville. I, I got on plane, flew in. I knew so little about Knoxville. I rented a car and I, turned, I rode the wrong way. I went into Maryville instead <laughs> of Knoxville. And I didn't know the difference. I had to stop and ask. I said, is this Knoxville? I said, I thought it would be bigger than this. And they go, no, man, it's 30 miles that way, right? So I so I go and I stay for a couple of days. Oddly enough, I turn on the TV about 6 o'clock on a Saturday night, and I watch the worst wrestling program I had ever seen. It was John Kazanis' show. It was absolutely horrible. Compared, I was comparing it to what we were doing in Tampa. And it was the commentator was doing terms like when the guy would throw a punch, he'd go, There it is, another warp your head off, hole. There's another warp your head off, hole. I mean, it was like, Hi, dog, what are they doing here? It it was the most country uh, hillbilly. And that's, that's, of course, you know, what they were appealing to at at some points. But uh, it was was a pretty low budget local television show at that point. Uh, I will will agree with that. It was terrible. It was terrible. And it was located on a little station, only got out about 25 miles. Uh, they were on top of the mountain, and you couldn't get up there if it snowed. You had to walk from the bottom of the mountain to the top to get there to do the television. So so I, I watched the show, and I said, you know, I told my wife, I said, damn, I, I'd like I, I got. I know how to do a hell of a lot better program than this. Let's find out what this guy's doing. So I did my research. I got in touch with him. I bought. I bought Knoxville for a lot more money than what anybody thought it was worth. In fact, I was kind of like a joke when the word got around. They went, "He paid how much for that town?" You know, I was like, "God, a money! That's absolutely ridiculous." And uh, it turned out it's probably the best little small territory in the world at one time there was no better place that had a had the short shots like that place had and guys could make the kind of money they were making there it would turned out to be a phenomenal business but uh it took a long time to build it you 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 clearly had a plan though at the start because Knoxville was it centered around the Wright brothers and, and Whitey Caldwell had been dead a couple of years at that point, but it centered around the Wright brothers and, and whoever they were working with and used some talent from, you know, the office in Nashville underneath the card or whatever, but they never brought in big names there. It didn't seem like an NWA territory per se, in terms of name talent or, you know, top guys coming in and out. And you'd kind of changed that right off the bat, bringing in all the top you had the, the NWA world champion come in. You had Moolah come in. You had the world junior heavyweight champion come in. You tried to turn it around and make it a, a big name focused territory. Did you think that just the difference in talent was going to do the trick, which it pretty much did? Yeah, I, I felt like, well, first of all, we changed the television, obviously. We got rid of that commentator and Les Thatcher. I got Les Thatcher on board to do the commentary. Uh, that I made a great television product. Uh, I was able, I was the first one to do instant replays and the first one to do split screen. I was doing things that nobody else in the country was doing, uh, long before everybody grasped that it could be done. And, uh, so that helped me considerably. And then I, you know, I had done a lot of traveling, Jim. Uh, I've been to Australia early on in my career in 73. I spent three months in Australia. The second time I was there, uh, I learned, I met a whole lot of people. Uh, I wrestled all over the Caribbean and out throughout Florida. I was going a lot to St. Louis and working for Muchnick because 
there was they were kind of grooming me to maybe be champion. If I hadn't have bought Knoxville, I think they, that might have happened. But uh, that, and then in St. Louis, when you work St. Louis, you work with some of the best talent in the world. Every card there, every guy on the card was from somewhere else. And they much just brought in the big stars. And uh, and I got to stay there for a year and a half. I worked every show for a year and a half in much in the in uh, St. Louis, uh, every other, every other Friday night. So I was gaining a lot of uh, knowledge about who was good and who wasn't and, and creating relationships that I utilized when I got my business started. And I was paying booking to start with, and they were sending me talent. And, uh, they were, it was horrible. They had, they were sending me bad guys and then they wouldn't even show up. So, you know, I called them up and talked to Nick. I said, Nick, I said, you know, not only can I not build my town, I think you guys are going to kill my town. I said, I can't do business with you anymore. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I'm not paying you the booking anymore. He goes, wait a minute, boy. You know, you ain't do that. You know, uh, you got just one of our towns. I said, no, it's my town. I bought the damn town. I'm telling you, I'm going to get my own guys. Don't send anybody here anymore and don't ever expect another check from me. Oh, and uh, it was so, you know, they, they right away, I became a real heel to Nick and probably to Roy because Roy was still involved at the time. But Roy never called me and said, hey, you can't do that or whatever. He did, they just basically backed away. And that enabled me then to start bringing in talent. And, uh, and talking about Dutch Mantell, he was one of my first guys. Dutch Mantell and John Foley, an old Englishman, came in yeah. and worked for me. Dale Lewis came in and worked for me. Uh, Jody Hamilton came out of Atlanta. Rock Hunter came out of Atlanta. Uh, Thatcher worked for me some. Uh, Nelson Royal, great friend, started coming in and wrestling for me on a fairly regular basis. And uh, it took me a year and a half of starvation, you know, and, and I spent all the money that I had saved in the years that I was in Florida. And I finally turned it around. And uh, and it started in about uh, late 75. Everything started to get really good. And by 76, 77, 78, it just roared. I mean, we were doing tremendous business. I think you were there one time at a fan convention. Yes, I was. When, the, the 1978 uh, Wrestling Fans International Association Convention. We've talked about it here on the, on the show before it was, with a couple of our guests. It was a highlight of of the, the conventions they had, except for the hotel we stayed in. That got panned. But, but no, we got to see, uh, you know, the top show at the Coliseum. We got to see the studio show. Uh, everybody was thrilled at that territory. And you're right. It, it was a, a great short trip territory where guys could still make that kind of money because Knox would do 4,000 plus people and, and, and Johnson city and, and Kingsport and the spot shows around there in Eastern Kentucky. I've, as a matter of fact, I'm almost talking myself into trying to run it again. We, 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 one of us or the other has run city of Knoxville every decade for the last 50 years, I think. Um, but you, you had better success than I did. Well, it, I was probably there at a different time and it got yeah. hurt. It, 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 it got hurt in 79 and it really kind of decimated, uh, decimated that town for a little bit of time, but there were, there were spot shows there. And I'm sure you, you've, you've heard of, uh, Harlan, we ran Harlan, Kentucky. It was a population of 3,000 people, and the gym held 3,300, and we sold out the gym every other Saturday night. We drew more people than the city's population, uh, 3,000 every other Saturday night. It was amazing. It was a big old round gym. It was built. I don't know why they would build a gym that size in a little town like that, but basketball's big in Kentucky. I guess that's well, the only thing it. And actually, that's the only gym that size for about 80 miles around, so they all come to see the big games there. There you go. I mean, they didn't have any. There was no place else they could go and see it. So they would drive from far away to pack that sucker out. And, uh, you know, there were times, hell, in Knoxville, we own – I I have the – two largest crowds ever to see a sporting event in the Coliseum in Knoxville were wrestling crowds. And, uh, both of them were me against, uh, against Harley. And, uh, 
And the building seated about 7,000. And the first night they were rejected, we had 10,000 in there and more and another 10,000 outside on the, uh, on the patio, big patio area out there. I should have put a big screen out there and charged those people somehow. And I could have got a paid on a 10, you know, a 10,000 piece, uh, 20,000 people, uh, potentially there. So, you know, we really, we really rocked it. Uh, it was big time there. And, uh, when I go back nowadays, I'm still recognized. It's just amazing. In fact, I just did it Saturday, the big, uh, big Kahuna wing fest, 20,000 people there. And I was to get the celebrity, uh, judge for the wing contest. I'm, so, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Cause I love wings. <laughs> well, well, it was a, it was, the wings were tremendous, but you know, it's just amazing how much they still remember me from there. And, uh, and a lot of other guys that were there during that time frame too. Well, it was you, big. You know, the, the TV was so strong and, and some of the guys, and I, of course I know I got mileage out of, I will say that he was a great performer, but I was able to, to use, uh, Archie, the Mongolian stomper, because he was so strong from that run. That I, re- I remember stories hearing you guys at the spot shows up in Eastern Kentucky to keep Archie from getting stabbed or cut. You just let him run to the to the ring and let the baby face beat him up for four or five minutes, and then he'd just run and get counted out so he wouldn't start a riot. It was it, we had riots a, a lot of times, and he got scared, and it was even beyond that. I had to hire him a full time policeman out of Knoxville that rode with him to every town, and that was the guy that watched his back. Yeah, Archie oh, says I, I'm not going to work. He says I'm not going to work these towns anymore if I don't have a, a, somebody that knows what the hell they're doing to watch after me. So I hired a guy that was a friend of mine who was a cop that that uh, that just uh, went full time. I think he quit the force and just went full time for me watching Archie's back. Uh, so it was crazy. Uh, you know, you know numbers and television numbers. I tell you how strong the TV was in 1977. Uh, in the summer book of 1977, there were four stations there. Uh, we were on at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. We had an 80 share. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, an 80 share, and the sales, the sales, the head sales guy at the station pushed the book across. He said, Ron, look at that. Look at those numbers. And I was like, wow, that's pretty big. He goes, that's not just pretty big, Ron. He goes, you are the biggest audience on television in this city and all the channels from sign on Saturday morning to primetime Saturday night, you're beating football. He was like, he was like amazed. He said, you're beating football. He says, we charge normally 50, $75 a spot. We're getting 300 for years. And he said, we got a three month waiting list to get on the show. So well, I remember it was, and, and channel 10 had that signal that just cut through those mountains. Channel 10 was the strongest uh, station in the market and, and went 50 or 60 miles easily in every direction. Even with those mountains, it just, it just beamed every, you could pick it up on the fillings in your teeth. And, oh, well, it was tremendous. And, and that was, you know, that was the thing to do on Saturday afternoon was watch Southeastern championship wrestling. Even Phil Rainey, Phil Rainey looked good next to Les Thatcher. That's how good Les was. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, so both those guys were working there for me, Phil Rainey and Les, and uh, we had a hell of a product. And uh, and that station we actually cranked out to about a hundred miles. It would go as we were running towns uh, that were more than a hundred miles from Knoxville, Pikeville, Kentucky, and uh, yeah. way up beyond Corbin, and uh, way off to the to, to the east of Corbin. There were and. And it went into North Carolina. It went down south quite a ways. It was a mega station, had big signal. And when I moved off of that Channel 26 on the top of the mountain to Channel 10, that's what popped business, obviously. Then I didn't have just one town and maybe Morristown. I had a potential territory. And uh, that's, that's what made it happen. And the guys also, uh, they liked and enjoyed working there because – they could be at the lake in, in Knoxville till five o'clock in the afternoon and then go to the town and not be late. And, and you'd get back home and sleep in your own bed uh, most time, but you were still running, you know, full schedule, but what it just to, to show the young folks these days, I'm not asking you to do anybody's tax returns, but you were the promoters. You know, what guys were getting paid. What were the top guys in the territory making 
on average on a week in in the late seventies when when everything was was cooking? Uh, I'd say a guy like Archie was averaging better than the grand. Yeah, that better that's, than a thousand a week, and there were probably a couple of other guys that were in that uh, that range. Most guys were six, eight hundred dollars a week, uh, and we're talking late seventies when that was a pretty damn substantial amount of money. Yeah, well, we and, we do uh, we do the uh, today's money bit here on the program. Ever since I found out how you how to do it on a computer. Um, and that uh, for, for people who think, oh my gosh, re- money is bigger in wrestling. Now, most guys are starving now, whereas guys, uh, they're in a territory home every night of the week, very small road expenses and a thousand dollars would be equivalent to uh 3000 or better today. And, uh, oh, yeah. I don't think people understand, you know, what the, the difference in the, the money has not picked up with the level of inflation in wrestling is what I'm saying, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that's for sure. And uh, you know, our longest trip, our longest trip was 110 miles. That was the longest trip that we had, and uh, that was we had two of those a week, and the rest of them were were 40 or 50 miles. Except for Knoxville, you were home. It was absolutely beautiful, beautiful little territory, and uh, and that's why I was able to get such tremendous talent. They were making money. They had nowhere to go. And you're talking about going to the lake. There was some, there's the most beautiful lakes in the world right there in that part of the country. There was a lake there called Norris that most of those guys had their boats on. And it was, you could drop a dime in the water and watch it, uh, 50 feet deep. I mean, it was just fabulous. And, and, uh, and also it's, it was still only about three or four hours drive down to Atlanta for the stars on Atlanta TV that, you know, that was close proximity. And, and I'm going to ask you this because now we've already established on the show that the Welch family and the Funk family both really descended from uh, the same mentor, Cal Farley. Um, Eddie Graham uh, spent a lot of time in West Texas with Cal Farley uh, early in his career and, and Dory Funk Sr. How important when you were running Knoxville was the NWA, was the alliance, and, and being able to talk to guys like Eddie Graham because you'd had success working for him and – and and get talent and get dates on the champion and et cetera. They, for the size of your territory, you had an outsized, uh, it seemed like uh, imprint with the NWA champions always being able to get the title in and 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 you know a lot of top talent. Uh, it was well I, during my years in Florida, Dad was involved in that operation. Lester Welch was involved in that operation. Uh, a lot of people other than Eddie were involved there and. Uh, oh. And I joined the NWA as soon as I got Knoxville opened up. Uh, I was the youngest NWA promoter in the history. And in 1985, I was elected vice president of the dang in the, the NWA. I wasn't 30 years old, and I was elected vice president. So, so I had I had a lot of friends there. I met a lot of wrestler wrestling promoters there that. And I knew a lot of them because I had been doing a lot of traveling in the early seventies. Once I got my, my act together and I was, I was pretty darn good. Then I, I got to go and wrestle for the funks. I got to wrestle for Terry. I got to wrestle for, uh, for Stu Hart in uh, Canada. I got to wrestle for, uh, Roy Shires in California, uh, Owens in, in Oregon. I, I got, I kind of started building the name for myself and making connections with those guys. And I was treated well by the NWA, but I think everybody, I wasn't treated any better than anybody else. Everybody got their shot at having the champion come in because I had a small town and I didn't have a bunch of big cities. I didn't get him for a whole week. I got him for, I was lucky to get him for two nights and sometimes just one night. He'd fly in there and do the deal and leave. But when they came, I had great rapport with those guys because I had worked with all those champions, Briscoe and Harley and Terry and Junior and you know, I had history with those guys, and they would come in, and obviously, I they I would work with them, and they would make they would leave there making. Uh, Harley made two thousand two thousand twenty two hundred dollars one night, you know, in cash. Yeah, th- forty years ago. Is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, twenty two hundred for that one shot. Carly told me when I paid him, he said, Ron, he goes, I will work here any time you can get me. He goes, book me here as much as you can. 
You know, he really, really had good rapport with those guys, and uh, and they all they all just really treated me great. They worked their butts off when they came, and and we helped build it. The kind of matches we had built it. I mean, you know that people went home. They still talk when I go to Knoxville. They go, God, I saw you and Harley race. It's the greatest wrestling match I ever saw in my life. You know, they it, they never forgot it. We did two one hours there, and uh, it was it was phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, it was a great place to be and a great and and a, and a wonderful thing. And then it turned into being the same thing in Pensacola when when they end up going there. You know, even better at the beach. <laughs> yeah, you you always you always get the primo short trip territories as established. And and I've, I've, I I got to say one thing also about isn't it ironic. That the other end of the state from from Nashville, you know, guys were making those kind of payoffs over there and and enjoying life. And and Nick Nick, on the other hand, had a reputation for sending people across the country for for pennies, um, and was not very popular. Uh, in some cases, with you, you had bigger talent in your end of the territory than at, at one point than Nick had in his, because I I don't think Nick had the same cachet with his his talent uh, maybe as you did. What, what, oh yeah, I mean, what what do you think of Nick Goulas? I never got a chance to meet oh, him. He's, he's the one that got away from me. Oh gosh, man, uh, you you'd have a bunch of stories about him, Jim. It's too bad you didn't get to meet him. Uh, I tell you, my first my first night I ever worked for Nick, and uh, Rob was working in there. My brother was working in there, and I was in Florida, and this was probably 1972, maybe. And uh, Rob says, why don't you come up here and work for a week? So I said, okay, well, I'll just take a vacation here and come up and work with you and travel with you and spend some time with you. And the first night I was Huntsville, Alabama, and it's one of the towns that Nick ran. And Nick came and told me, you know, he says, he says, you know, boy, uh, you you got a you got a fire out there. Some now, you know, uh, we 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 do things different here. And 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 I'd been working in Florida, and back in those days, Eddie and those guys, they were very particular about what they did. That uh, you did not you did not use gimmicks. Uh, I mean, you didn't pull something out of your trunks. You didn't. Uh, you know, they had very little blood. It was, they were, Jack Briscoe, they were trying to do the Jack Briscoe thing. And they, you know, they wanted to keep it really, really legitimate and tough and a lot of wrestling. And so I went in there expecting to find that. And when I went to the ring, it was a six man tag. And on the way to the ring, people were handing me knives, <laughs> knives and, 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 and brass knucks. And I was like, what are you doing? And they said, take it. You're going to need it. I was like, are you kidding me? I said, well, why? I got to the ring. I had a handful of shit in my hand. I had a handful of stuff in my hand that had been handed me by fans. And I said, what? I asked Rob, I said, what do I do with this? And he said, I'll just lay it in the corner. He said, you might want to use it. I was like, oh, come on, man. So we go out there. It, it was the damnedest match I think I was ever in. I think five out of the six of us were bleeding. And uh, and they were just, it was just everybody going crazy. And uh, so I came back in the dressing room, and Nick came over to me. And he said, hey, oh, what the hell? You didn't, you didn't use none of your gimmicks, and you didn't do this, and you didn't do that. And uh, and I knew who Nick was. I had met him several times, but I'd never worked for him. So I said, uh, I said, listen, Nick, I said, you don't talk to me that way. I said, you may tell these other guys anything you want. I said, I'm going to go to that ring and I'm going to do whatever the hell I want to do. And I'm not going to change my style to make you happy because I don't have to. And, uh, he was like, he went, I saw him, he went over to talk to Rob privately. And, and I asked Rob, I said, what did he say? And he said, he said, boy, your brother's kind of touchy, ain't he? You know, he, <laughs> you know, he, he don't take much crap, does he? I said, <laughs> So I said, no, he don't cry. So it was, Nick was a strange character. Uh, if you liked him, you liked him. And there was a lot of guys that didn't like him. He was famous for not paying very well. And, uh, and he tried, he was a little bit overbearing. He wanted to have his way and he wanted to have his say. And, and I think part of the problem he was having is Roy had been a worker in the business and Roy was really tough. Roy, I mean, guys were scared to death of Roy, 
and they didn't give him any crap. But Nick, in Nick's case, they didn't respect him because he'd never been in the ring, and it made it harder for him. He had a lot of power because he's Roy's partner, and you didn't mess with Nick without having to to, to uh, talk to Roy about it. It was going yeah. to be a problem, and everybody knew it. So Roy took up for Nick, and Nick felt like then that, well, I, I can say pretty much what I want to because uh, if anybody wants to whip my ass, I'll tell them you, you tell Roy about it, you know? <laughs> and uh, so it was, uh, it was, I didn't work for him. I was supposed to be there a week, and you're talking about how many miles. I'm going to give you a real quick example of what the difference was even between Florida. Florida, we used to do 2,000 miles a week. I thought that was horrible. You know, we used to work the Miamis and the Jacksonvilles out of Tampa and the West Palms and the Tallahassee and the Fort Lauderdale. I mean, you twice a week, 500 miles back and forth between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. And uh, so there were long trips there. But the next day after we left that hunt, that night in Huntsville, we went back to ta- to Nashville with Rob, and we got in the bed about 1 o'clock. And he says, before I went to bed, he says, hey, man, he goes, hey, you better get some good sleep real quick here because we got to get up early, and we got to go Memphis TV. I said, well, geez, how are you talking about? And he said, 5 o'clock. I said, 5 o'clock in the morning? He goes, and it's one now, right? I said, four hours from now? He goes, yeah, five o'clock, we got to go to Memphis TV. So we get in the car, we drive to Memphis. It snows that day, and you know they got a 90-minute live show, right? It snows, yeah. and it turns out me and Rob and Sputnik Monroe and Norville Lawson are the only guys that get to the to the TV. So we got to do a two out of three fall 90-minute television. Oh, Christ. It's all us. All us, okay? So we do the whole darn show, and then uh, after the show, I go in there, and I'm dragging, man, after, now I'm going, geez, man, where are, I'm looking over at him like, damn, man, this is a horrible start to the day, and he goes, hurry up. I said, what do you mean, hurry up? And he goes, we're in Chattanooga TV. Yeah. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, man. I said, that's 400 miles. I said, it's across the state. He goes, I know. We got to hurry. He said, we can grab some lunch if we hurry. So we go running across back through Nashville and on to Chattanooga. We get Chattanooga about 5 o'clock. We work TV there. And we work a long match there. So at the end of that, I go back. Man, I'm taking my clothes, my shoes off. And I'm like, damn, Rob, this is a He says, hurry up. I said, wait a minute, man. What are we going now? He goes, we're on the, house, the Chattanooga house show. He says, we can grab dinner real quick, and we'll run over and work the house show here. I said, damn, man, are you nuts? And he goes, he goes, Ron, he goes, I'm going to be honest with you. He says, we're lucky. He said, normally, I'd be on the first match here in Chattanooga TV, and I would have to work Birmingham TV live at 1130 <laughs> and then drive back to Nashville. I said, I told him, I said, Ron, I'm gone. He goes, what do you mean you're gone? I said, I'm not working past Memphis on Monday. I'm out of here, man. I said, this is absolutely outrageous. What the hell kind of life is this? <laughs> you know? And they were doing that kind of shit that, that, that every week. They had all these live TVs. They weren't making tapes. It was like crazy how they were running the business. I've I've heard from from Eddie Marlin. He and Tommy Gilbert did that that loop on a lot of Saturdays where they every single town – uh, on Nick's end, had a live studio show instead of sending the tape around. So Nashville, Chattanooga, Birmingham, Huntsville had live studio shows. And the, but Jerry Jarrett, this is what I was going to ask you: How did you get along well? Get along with Jerry Jarrett uh, probably better than Nick because you you spent a lot of time in there. You worked the Memphis end, especially when you were setting up Knoxville. You were the Southern heavyweight champion for Jarrett, and he did the Memphis TV, and then ran Louisville and a few of the towns up north. So you were. Actually, while you were trying to establish a promotion at one end of the state, you were the top heel and working two or three days a week at the other end of the state. That's correct. And what happened there is when I went to Knoxville, I, the town was dead. They, you know, they, they, they weren't drawing, they weren't drawing 500 people. And uh, so I had to find me a place to go. And I talked to Jerry and Jerry needed a guy. He needed somebody to work on top because Lawler had been there a long time and he wanted to give him a break, I guess. And, uh, and he says, Ron, come in here. And, uh, so I went in there in 74. I worked for him for probably 18 months. My territory was so 
bad getting started that if it hadn't have been for having those shows in Memphis, I wouldn't have been able to pay my losses from my company that I just bought. And it kept me alive and it enabled me to build Knoxville during that year and a half that I worked on Mondays for Jerry. Now, the deal was I had to have my own Knoxville TV, and it was on Saturdays. I couldn't miss doing my own TV. Jerry realized that. So I never, in 18 months, I sold out that that, uh, Coliseum practically every Monday night, and I never worked a live match on that TV. Ever. Well, that that's right, because I was watching the studio show at the time up here in Louisville, and, and you did work Louisville on Tuesdays. You'd come, come over for Monday and Tuesday because that was the two biggest towns. But you never were on the studio. You, you sent uh, some match films in, and you sent um, promos in, but you never actually made the studio. But And also, you with uh, – and gosh, Mark James, uh, my cohort will get mad at me, uh, uh, cause I don't know the exact statistics, but you had three or four matches for the NWA title with, uh, with Terry, uh, and then, and I think with Harley also, maybe at the switch, uh, several times in that time period, first six months of 75 and did 10, 11,000 people, uh, you know, for each one of them, there was huge business at that time, especially with Lawler gone. And, and, you know, with, yeah. With, uh, you know, because he had just finished having that hot run with Fargo, et cetera. Uh, but that had to be, I, because I, I did the same thing, by the way, with WWF paychecks supporting my Knoxville wrestling habit. Only mine didn't end as well as yours did. Uh, but uh, it, you had to be mentally stressed having to go back and forth. And you're basically working every night of the week between the two territories and trying to set your own thing up. Oh, yeah. I, I yeah, it was, it was it was tough times. It was tough times, uh, but Jerry was flying me in there. He was paying my expenses. He was paying my hotel room. Uh, he was taking care of me good. I was my, my payoffs were good. I have no complaints with the way I was handled by Jerry. Uh, he did he did me really right, and I hope he thinks I did him really right. We we did. I'd work with Briscoe there. I worked with Terry there. I worked. I hardly wasn't around at that point. But I did do a bunch, uh, and he booked me with a, a lot of guys that I had never worked with, and 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 I had always wanted to. Dick the Bruiser and uh, the Sheik. Uh, I mean, it was guys like that, and we were constantly and consistently doing eleven, ten, eleven thousand dollars, eleven thousand people, pretty much every Monday night. And to begin with, it was just Memphis, and then as time went on, I needed more money, so I told him I would work Louisville for it. And I did start working Louisville some, uh, and I don't know how long it was that I did work Louisville, but it was a shorter period of time. I worked Memphis for longer than I did work in Louisville, but I never worked the show, never had a TV live TV match on anything for Jerry, and uh, just did those interviews. Um, and, uh, and, and and I, will, I did I interviews say, each night. I will say one thing: I saw the, the the film of you and Bruiser, and the visual was incredible. Cause you were like two feet taller than Bruiser, and he was two feet wider than you. It looked like a funhouse mirror. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was fucking great. <laughs> but hey, yeah. and 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 we we teased him a little a little while ago. But talk about you've decided now to start the Stud Cast, um, which is basically what made you decide to 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 come out of. You've been in retirement for a while. You worked in the hockey. And you've done a bunch of things you wanted to do. But why have you decided to come back and, and actually tell these cool stories in public and, and this kind of thing you're going to be telling on the stud cast? Uh, I, 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 after, and a lot of people probably don't know, after I finished wrestling, I got into hockey. I bought a minor league team, bought a second team the second year, had the two most most uh, profitable hockey, minor league hockey teams probably in the history of the world. And uh, did great with them because I did a lot of wrestling stuff with them. And then I retired for seven years after I sold my second hockey team. And then I got into ADT. You probably know nothing about this. I got a franchise from ADT for the Tampa market doing security systems. Didn't know a damn thing about security systems or the business. And uh, within five years, I had the 12th largest ADT dealership in North America. We were we were in uh, Orlando. We had offices in Orlando and Sarasota, Tampa, and Spring Hill. We were doing... We were the biggest dealer in the southeastern United States. Uh, so I did that for 12 years. 
and uh, and then I sold that thing. So then I quit for a while, and then I kind of got Rob got me back and started, and he said, you know, we I'm going over here to so and so, and they'd like to have you come sign autographs. So I went and signed autographs, and then I kind of got the, the hearing about the podcast and. And I thought, you know, nobody knows much about the history of my family. It's that we are the oldest and the largest wrestling family on the planet. Nobody is wrestling. No, has more family members that wrestled than we do. And nobody covers that time span from 1924 to Jimmy Golden is still working. So I can say we're still at it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's 93. Well, I don't know. That's, that's I don't know, 93 years, I guess, 93 years of wrestling in my family. And, uh, I just uh, said, you know, I want to tell the story. I mean, it, I, there's a, there's a legacy here, you know, and, and I, I need to, I need to make people aware that of who, who we were and what we accomplished in our lifetimes. And, uh, and that kind of, uh, what got me involved in it. And then I said, you know, let me go. And so I got myself a website, Ron Fuller, Tennessee stud website. Uh, I got on Facebook under Ron Fuller Welch. And I got on Twitter. I'm in the Ron Welch Fuller there. Cause I had to change the names around. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, I've gotten myself started back into it. Uh, and, and I've already done four of these. I've done four. I've got four in the can and we're looking at the, First, uh, first uh, stud cast is going to go live on uh, Monday, uh, July the tenth, and uh, and they can go to my website, Ron Fuller Tennessee Stud, and be able to pick up that. And uh, and if you know, if you'd like to be friends on Facebook, they can find me at Ron Fuller Welch. And so I'm kind of getting back involved. I, I'm kind of uh, I'm trying to make a comeback here. I guess is what it is. I'm going to make kind of a comeback, man. And uh, and get back into wrestling. And I always want to do that, Jim, when I got out in 88 with, with Vince and all that stuff going on. And I was lucky enough to see it coming and sell mine. Uh, you know, I, I, I said that I want to end my career the way I began in, in the same sport as my grand, as my granddad and my dad. And, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, that's what my goals are here is to end up, by telling this whole story, my family's history, as it relates to the also the growth of professional wrestling. We have a lot to do with it. First wrestling bear, Roy Welch. You know, you look on the internet, you're going to find uh, somebody else. That's crap, Daddy. The first wrestling bear was Roy Welch, and I've got pictures of him jumping off the top rope on the bear's back in 1937. <laughs> you know, and that bear had all its teeth and all its claws. So you're a bad yeah, son of a bitch they, if, you, if you can train a bear that has his teeth in his claws. They hadn't perfected that wrestling bear shit back then, so they pretty much just brought the bear in, and 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 here we go, right? That was it. Oh hell yeah! I mean, you know, the bear could work. I mean, he taught him to do some work, but but he they had to put a muzzle on him and they had to put mittens on his feet because they didn't pull his canines and pull his claws like they do bears later on. You know, that bear could kill you. In fact, he almost did. He almost killed my dad when he was 12 years old. He got a hold of my dad at 12 years old and damn near killed him. Good Lord. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the kind of stuff that's going to be on the stud cast. Everybody knows where to find it. It's debuting, what was it, July 10th? July 10th. Monday, July, July 10th. 10th. Uh, first one comes out. First one comes out. And, uh, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. It's basically I don't have people that I'm interviewing. It's just me telling the story of my family, stories like we've talked about here today, that type of deal. And I'm going to just – I'm going to – I'm going to put my family on the map. We should have been there a long time ago. I'm going to put my family on the map where it ought to be. And people are going to, hopefully by the end of this, they'll listen. They'll enjoy the broadcast. It's going to be historical because it is history. And I happen to know a lot of it, maybe more than anybody in the business what? could be me because of my relationships and my family and my granddad taking me for years and years on the road and telling me stories I know everything and how it was all done. And another good story down the line sometime, if we want to do another one, Jim, is how he built his territories. You won't believe how he accomplished that. Well, and, and this is, I'm, I'm excited because I've done some columns and I've done a couple of books as related to wrestling here in Louisville in the Memphis area. And obviously we've touched on 
the Welch family and talked about the lineage before and the sheer number of people involved in it, but this is going to be a chance to hear some of those cool stories. And I want one more from, from you. It can be short before you go, but Herb Welch, was a guy who started wrestling, as you said, in the twenties, and he still worked on some of the shows around Dyersburg that they would run probably just for the hell of it. From what I've heard of him, just because he enjoyed uh, getting in the ring and cranking up on people. He, but it's still in the seventies. So 20, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it was six decades or whatever it was. Um, it, it, he was he was a, a main event guy in almost every territory in the South and and a pre TV World War II days et cetera et cetera, and I've heard he was a tough son of a gun too. Tell us a Herb Welch shooting story, if you have one, or any kind of Herb Welch story for that matter. Well, I'll tell you a Herb Welch story, but I hope this is kind of a little off the wall in a way. First of all, let me tell. I don't know if you're aware, he was the world junior heavyweight champion one time for five years straight. Uh, and he, he, he lost it because he had, he never lost it. He had a car wreck that almost killed him and he was out of wrestling for two years tire- entirely. Came, made a comeback after that, but, uh, he was a, a tremendously tough son of a gun and a great worker. Uh, people hated to work with him. So I'll tell you a story real quick. Back in the days, uh, there was a guy that worked for Roy and, uh, and he was a farmer. And he came to the matches. He never took a shower. Okay. He was like the type of guy when you went in the ring to wrestle him, he'd like, Oh, he stunk so bad. So Roy, Herb told him, Herb kept telling him he working with him. He said, Hey, you got to start taking a bath, man. You got to <laughs> take a shower before you get in the damn ring. Right. And the guy says, ah, Herb, you can kiss my ass. You know, I ain't going to do it. Right. So he says, okay, all right. So he one night, that's a two out of three fall match. So first match, the first fall, he goes out there, and the guy gets him in a headlock or whatever it is, and Herb just goes, oh, man, this son of a gun. He stunk so bad. So he went back to the dressing room after the first fall, and he crapped in his hand. <laughs> and he rubbed it under his armpit. <laughs> and then he went back to the ring. And then when they rang the bell, he went back to the ring. And when they rang the bell, he went across and he snatched this guy in the headlock, turned his face and shoved it into his armpit and clamped down on him and went down on him and held him. And he, the guy's kicking and screaming and flailing in the ring. And the people in the crowd don't know what's going on. He just got a headlock. They're like, what in the hell? He says, the crowd's are real quiet. Like, what in the hell's going on? They're trying to figure out what's, what's this all about. And he says, finally, Herb says, he, he said, I let him go. And he said, he stood up. He said he had crap all over his face, right? And he says, the crowd's still quiet. And he says, he screamed real loud. He says, referee, this man has shit. (laughs) 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 There's your herb story. (laughs) Well, and and the the podcast is going to be exciting. The the Welch family goes from the the carnival days to actually the days of national television. And uh, it's probably been around almost almost as long as the Wright brothers' invention has the Welsh family yeah. involved in wrestling. So, uh, the Stud Cast debuts July tenth. It's Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller on Facebook and all the other stuff that you just uh, mentioned. And and Brian, I'm sure we'll be able to help you uh, by giving you some some tweets and stuff when that becomes available. Ron, okay, thanks. yeah, the website website's Ron Fuller Tennessee Stud, and the Facebook is Ron Fuller Welch. And uh, I appreciate it, Jim. Hey, I've really enjoyed it, man. Uh, anytime I can, I can uh, come on with you. I will. I will. I'll gladly do it. Oh, I'm, don't worry. I'm going to be hitting you up. I don't care if anybody else likes it. I'm just. I'm marking out for the old Tennessee stories that I've never got to hear. So we'll we'll do this again.